Hi, I'm Shira Karpow. And I'm Shana Gaunt, and we're board certified behavior analysts. At How To ABA, we provide practical resources, community, and support to ABA professionals. In each episode of our podcast, we will be having real conversations with real people sharing real stories about ABA. We'll share relevant strategies and actionable tips that will make us all better ABA practitioners. It's the ABA content you need that you're not going to learn in a textbook. Hi, everyone. Today, we are talking with our guest, Rosa Casali, who is a BCBA and the founder of Behavior Solutions, which is um, an agency that operates in South Florida, providing in-home care. Welcome, Rosa. Hi, thank you. Hi, Rosa. Um, Hello. (laughs) So what we like to start with is tell us a little bit about you, your background, and kind of how you got into the field. Sure. Sure. So um, my background, so I've been doing ABA, I've been in the field of ABA for, well, since 2008, so about 13 years. Uh, I really love the field. I'm a BCBA, as you said. Um, All of my experience has been here in Miami. Um, I have a master's degree in mental health counseling, but ended up in ABA, (laughs) loved ABA. And how did I end up in that in, in that particular field? Um, a class in college. Oh, really? <laughs> a class in college that I actually ended up failing because it was an advanced ABA and I hadn't taken any ABA before. <laughs> so I ended up failing and retaking it because I thought it was just so interesting. I sort of like, I, I had always been looking for, um, I definitely liked helping families and children, but I wanted to find a field or a moda- modality, if you will, where you could help hands-on, mm-hmm. you know, help people and help families, children hands-on. When I saw this, I'm like, oh, this is it. <laughs> I definitely, definitely uh, identified it and mm, haven't looked back since. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, uh, yes, I work here in Miami, um, mostly in, at home therapy and at schools. Um, love what I do. Most of my kids are, you know, between the ages of three and 10. Although sometimes I do also have some teenagers and yeah, again, I love what I do. (laughs) That's awesome. That's great. Um, so we were talking earlier, you started telling us about, um, really the community that you serve, which is, is it Miami that you're in? Yes. Yes. And I guess in the greater South Florida area and how, um, what's really required from like a a cultural competency perspective and from diversity. So how does that play into how you practice? Yes. So I'm very lucky. I feel very lucky to work in the, in the, the city that I work in. Um, South Florida would be, you know, Miami Dade, Broward, Palm beach. Um, It's a, it's a big city. (laughs) It's a big metropolitan area. Um, and it's wonderful in the sense that um, we are a great melting pot of different cultures, especially Hispanics, especially Latin people. Um, we make about 70% of them, uh, of the population, me one of them. <laughs> and uh, it definitely makes it interesting. It's, it's very uh, varied. You, you, you see people from all over the world, you learn from people all over the world and from the way they see Um, autism, the way they see disability, the way they approach it and the way they um, progress, you know, with it. So it's, it's a very different and very, it's a great learning opportunity for me every day. How do they approach it? Like, what is the perspective? Well, every culture is different. So um, there's cultures that will see disability or autism like a curse that fell on you, for example, uh, or many other cultures, sometimes Hispanic cultures uh, will see it as, oh, you know what, he's just spoiled. Or, you know what, you just, you, he just needs a, you know, sturdier hand. Many times they don't identify that, you know what, there is something here that needs extra care, that needs extra um, attention. Um, I remember, I mean, growing up in Colombia and South America, I, re- I never, I mean, I lived there for 17 years and I don't remember having seen maybe one person with autism 
And it wasn't that they were not there, but it was the fact that there was not um, availability or they didn't have the tools to um, identify, you know, autism or uh, a disability or a delay in um, development, you know, so these these kids, they would stay behind, you know, they would stay at home uh, or in places where you really didn't have access or they didn't have access to uh, the community. Right. So that, of course, you you bring it up with you when you uh, when you come to this country or when your kids grow in this country as well. Sometimes they don't understand. And many times on the first um, on the initial interview, they asked me, Rosa, do you think he's going to get cured? Rosa, do you think he's going to you know, be, be uh, a successful person? Do you think he's going to be able to go to college? And, and that just shows you, you know, the, the, sometimes there's a, a big lack of uh, uh, information and resources. And so we, uh, I, I'm proud that I get to be part of that solution, you know, that I get to help him and show them towards, uh, point them towards the, the right um, resources. Because, of course, you know, a, a diagnosis is definitely not an easy thing for a parent. And if on top of that, you don't have the resources, it makes it a lot more complicated. Absolutely. And, you know, we talk about and thank goodness, as a field, we're starting to evolve and talk more and more about cultural diversity and talk about, you know, the education behind that. You're living it on a day to day basis, yes. which is Great. Um, you, any advice for people who are, you know, have various families or have families from various ethnicities? Yes, definitely. Uh, and these are things that, of course, um, I that I didn't get this out of a book or anything like that. It's just things that on my daily life. That's what the things I see that help me uh, with my clients. So. Um, the first thing I'm going to say, um, take your time to study, <laughs> if you will, to study that culture or that nationality, that, that ethnicity, as simple as a Google search, you know, as simple as a Google search or just asking and researching a little bit. It doesn't have to be too long or anything fancy, but just to see how, how the, you know, how it differs from yours, how it differs from your own uh, culture and from your customs, from your habits. Um, many times you're going to find things that were a really big deal and you go like, oh, I didn't know that. For example, you know, um, I remember one time I started seeing a Bangladeshi um, um, client, a family, and I didn't know anything about that country. And I showed up with a therapist who was a male and the mother was like, you know, she was super nervous and, and, and she didn't know what to do. And the guy, you know, he went very professional, you know, hi, nice to meet you. And then later on, like two days later, she goes like, you know, I'm not supposed to be in the house with a male, right? You know, I'm not supposed to touch a male that's not in my family, you know, and these things I would have probably known <laughs> if I had studied the, 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 you know, the culture a little bit better. And many things like that can help a lot, you know, if you just take the time to to study, to understand, you know. And the other, the other suggestion will be to just ask questions, you know. How do you prefer me to do this? How do you, uh, I see that you're not wearing shoes in the house. Would you prefer that I take my shoes off? Or, or is that okay that I keep my shoes on? How do you feel more comfortable? Um, these are the goals that I would like to work on. Um, but what do you think? What are some of the goals that you prefer? Because man, many times the goals that you think that are important, they're not important for them. And they have other different goals, you know, that they want to, uh, they want to acquire. Many times it's um, just, you know, tweaking things, you know, uh, and, and that makes a big difference. And that shows um, the parent and the family that you respect them and that you are flexible and willing to work with them. And that translates into great progress, you know, for the whole family, for uh, the client. And um, let's see what else. Um, pay attention to small details. <laughs> That's also something that I have learned over time. Uh, for example, his, uh, Hispanic cultures are very similar, but they're not necessarily the same. 
And there's very little details that you want to pay attention to and that make a big difference. Uh, for example, the eye contact. Some cultures, they don't like eye contact. <laughs> Some cultures, actually, if you're not looking at their eyes, they feel that it's a, that it's a, a that you're being rude to them, right? Yeah, disrespectful. disrespectful. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, the tone of voice. There's there's cultures, uh, uh, especially for example in the uh, uh, Caribbean cultures, they speak very loudly, and the tone of voice is really high. And at first, you might think that they're um, arguing with you, but no, they're just talking. <laughs> and this <laughs> is this is completely natural. And you just uh, if you already know, then you go look. Oh, okay. Well, they're just you know they're just talking. That's 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 natural. I'm laughing right now because I'm currently binge watching Modern Family. And if anyone's seen Modern <laughs> Family, Gloria on Modern Family is the exact same. I think she's from Colombia originally and she is, acting yeah. like she is. And she's uh, her voice is super loud. Yeah. And it sounds like she's yelling quite a lot. And they <laughs> actually joke around about that on the show. Yes, yeah. actually, she is Colombian like me. But I'm not like her. <laughs> <laughs> no high heels, no stilettos to work. <laughs> so um, the funny thing is that... Um, uh, you know, her and, and, and even within a country, things are different. She's from the coast, Sofia Vergara. She's from the coast and they tend to be very happy and very loud. They're, you know, the coolest people you'll ever meet. I'm from the center. I'm from the capital. We're more calm. We're more, you know, so I'm like, sure she, I'm sure you're still cool, Rosa. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope so. It's so true what you say about like, you know, looking at the details and trying to trying to understand where a family is coming from. And, and you know, what we deal even here where we're, we are in Toronto, we have lots of ethnicities that we deal with and lots of people from different backgrounds. And we have to remember to not put our agenda onto the families. You know, I think, for example, of this one student who doesn't sleep properly at night because the, the parents don't really care if he sleeps in his own bed. Like he sleeps with the parents. There aren't really set bedtime routines. There isn't really a set bed for this individual. And it, to me, it seems like a cultural thing. Like it's not part of where they come from, where like where I come from, it's everybody has their own bedroom and their own bed and a very specific bedtime. And you go to your bed and I go to my bed. And I really have to remind myself that like, just because I think it's important that as a 10 year old boy, you should go to sleep at eight o'clock and you should get a full night's sleep. Doesn't mean that it's important to the family. And so for a long time, we talked about this goal of a bedtime and sleeping in his own bed and it never happened. And the reason it never happened was because it just wasn't important to the parents. And so talking about what is important to them and using the goals that are important to them is only going to make more success and make our kids more successful um, because that's really gonna make meaningful change. Definitely. That is so true. Yeah. And many times, many times I, I, I've come to realize many times parent, I, I present a, a, a goal to the parents and the parents go, oh, OK, OK. Especially sometimes like a, a Asian uh, culture. Oh, OK, OK, OK. But they didn't really they didn't really want to do it. So uh, it, it's important to sit down and talk, you know, sit down and what is important to you? What do you need help with? What, is, you know, what is your uh, priority right now? Yeah, you know, for to, sure. To help in the way that they need. Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, not only is asking parent goals uh, important and following through with those parent goals, but also just pairing, you know, you talk about noticing the little things, noticing the little things, and then being able to act on those little things is huge. But mm -hmm. that comes down to pairing and relationship building. And then, you know, when you're listening and actually listening to their goals and doing something about them, that in, in, in and of itself is relationship development, right? Yeah. Most definitely. And if you have a good relationship, good, um, they feel that you respect them, then, that you respect them, then the progress is going to be wonderful. And I mean, little details, and I mean, little details, uh, there are countries where you come into their house and they offer you food and it's actually kind of uh, disrespectful to refuse food. And you know, as I, at least I remember so much in school that they would tell me, you know, in the ethics class, you know, mm -hmm. you do not accept food, you do not accept drinks, you never hug or kiss your clients or your family. Ooh, here in Miami, you know, everyone kisses everyone. 
doesn't go over well. If 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 a if a family member wants to, you know, kiss you on your way out and you go like, eh, you know, they're going to feel rejected. That's it's it's different, right? Yeah. <laughs> and and so those little details you might want to reconsider, you know, what feels uh, comfortable to you and what feels comfortable to them. And if something doesn't feel comfortable to you, you can also talk it out. You know? Absolutely. Things like that. You can just tell them, you know, uh, I, I, I really cannot accept food. I accept, I, I appreciate so much that you offer me food, but, you know, as part of our policies, you know, I don't want you to feel that I'm rejecting you or anything, but uh, just, you know, so that, you know, and parents, they start, you know, they, they, they react to that very well because you, you're keeping them and you're making them part mm-hmm. of the whole process and decision making. And again, Absolutely. they feel respected. You just brought back a memory for me that I haven't remembered in ages. And uh, it was a long time ago, but I walked into a client's house, you know, and uh, they offered, they didn't even offer me. They just gave me orange juice to drink. And it's just, here it is. It it appears and you must drink it and it must be gone before, you know, you leave. I'm allergic to orange juice, but I wanted to respect the culture. So I drank it. And I still remember sitting through that meeting. And the only thing I can think about is choking back this orange juice. And sure enough, I did. And I, you know, dealt with consequences later, but, uh, you know, it was, I think it was appreciated. And then I think there was a second meeting that I actually had with him that I was like, actually, you know, can I get a different kind of juice instead, please? That would be really great. Yeah, but yes. I think like the, the ethics rules are changing now to reflect <laughs> some of that diversity. And um, I know something that like you used to do, Shana, was kind of preempt those holiday gifts by like sending out an email way in advance so that you're not like standing at their doorstep, like giving back this gift. Um, but you send it out in advance, kind of explaining like, you know, why you will or won't be accepting gifts and please don't do it. You know, don't don't buy any gifts. So that that could be a really nice way around it. So you're not offending anyone, but yet you're still, you know, being ethical. Um, so I think that the, you know, the code is evolving as we're kind of, you know, practicing in the field and seeing what's really practical. Um, but I know I also, you know, we'll get a lot of, we'll get a lot of families who don't even want to get a diagnosis, right? I know it's different than in the States where a diagnosis gives you access to like a lot more, um, you know, early intervention and things like that. But some families feel like a diagnosis is very stigmatizing and like they don't even want to pursue it. Um, And the nice thing about ABA is I could say, well, you know, a diagnosis doesn't really matter. It's not going to change how I practice. It's not going to change the goals that we choose. So you don't have to get a diagnosis if you feel like that's just too scary. And, you know, we could just focus on like, okay, what is challenging you right now? Like what, you know, is he not toilet trained? Do you want to work on that? Do you want to work? Because diagnosis or not kids need to be toilet trained. Do we want to work on self-help skills or social skills, things like that? And I find that that, um, that's somewhat comforting to families because they don't feel like they have to confront this whole, you know, diagnosis. Um, what have you found to kind of get around that or, you know, what tricks do you use to make families who are a little bit opposed to this whole ABA thing or the autism thing or any diagnosis to make them feel a little bit, you know, more comfortable? Uh, you know, I've actually had that, had that happened to me more with American parents than with Hispanic parents. Yeah, I know. Interesting. It's the ones that like, okay, how are we going to cure my son or, how, uh, or you know what? He doesn't really need ABA. I'm just doing this because my wife wants to do it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's it's interesting however I see your point I see that uh, you know some parents find that stigmatizing and yes yes definitely you find that a lot and um unfortunately here yes if you uh, you know if you're paying out of pocket you don't have to have a diagnosis but if if the insurance is covering you which is you know 90 percent of the times you do have to have a, have a diagnosis um and they most parents are afraid because they don't want that in their um that diagnosis in their kids permanent record you know they don't want that mm-hmm. um so there's nothing we can do about that what i like to do i like to try to explain to them you know this doesn't mean because it comes you know the word autism or any other diagnosis comes with a with a stereotype and so they start thinking that oh you know my kid is not going to be successful Oh, my kid is not going to be able to do this or do that. And so what I like to focus is on um, 
talking about that, you know, talking about the reality, you know, um, yes, things are going to be more complicated, but you know what, the fact that we have this diagnosis doesn't mean he's not going to be happy, that he's not going to be, um, uh, he's not going to be able to accomplish so many other things that he's not going to be able to, you know, maybe go to school and even have a job in the future. You know, we don't know what the future holds, but this doesn't mean that he's not going to be able to accomplish a lot of other things, especially if we work hard, you know? So um, I, I like to focus on that instead because, well, is the reality, you know, there's, there's really no limit. So um, since we cannot do anything with the diagnosis with, you know, getting rid of it or not getting one, then uh, I like to go that route instead. Absolutely. Now you mentioned when we were talking before that you had just started an ABA clinic. Yes. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. How do you, uh, what's the name of your clinic? Behavior Solutions Inc. Excellent. So those people in South Florida, we'll put that in the show notes. Um, but uh, how do you train your staff in terms of being culturally diverse? Wow. That's a great question. So, um, it is a, it's, it's also very interesting because of, as I was saying before, uh, it's not only, you know, the client's culture, it's also the therapist's culture, absolutely, <laughs> which is usually another one. And then my culture, <laughs> you can't forget about that. And then a fourth one, which is the Miami culture. When we mix all of these things, something really interesting comes out, even an accent and everything. <laughs> and it, 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 it turns out really great and people from everywhere they we all end up talking the same way which is awesome um so to put everything in line it's uh it's um very interesting i like to do the things that i mentioned before i like to um uh, um have them you know um go, i have them go ahead and uh, pra- um sort of search you know research a little bit uh the culture we talk a lot about um, what would you do if this were to happen? What would you do? Um, I like to explore their own cultures as well. You know, um, just about a month ago, I had a, a problem with, you know, two different cultures. The therapist was from one culture and, and the, the parent were from another culture and they just did not click, you know, the, the way that this person, this therapist was, um, handling themselves in, in, in the, in their house, they didn't like it. They felt it was disrespectful. But me knowing this therapist culture, you know, they're a lot more uh, laid back and they tend to feel more comfortable. So that didn't match. So, you know, another great thing to do is, you know, feedback, asking the parents, asking the therapist, um, all those things help a lot so that, so that we can all play together we can all play together I also think it's huge to be able to recognize that some people just aren't a match together right it could be culturally but it could just be you know what you're just not a match for my kid and that's okay too and you know like you said keep that communication open and ask for client feedback and you know make that call early on instead of it you know going on for too long and then having to you know step back a few steps right Yes, definitely. And uh, actually, it took me a minute, it took me a while to, to, to realize that that's what it was. At first, I thought, you know, just personalities don't match. Just maybe, mm, you know, they have different, different ways of seeing things. And, you know, maybe the therapist has different goals than what their parents do. But no, no, at the end of the day, when I realized, you know, it's just that, you know, they have different, different habits, and they, they didn't really get along. Um, And that, teaches me really that taught me to to be a little bit more uh vigilant of those differences and to you know celebrate them and just talk about them so that we can all respect each other be happy and you know enjoy them because you know with different cultures comes a lot of great different things a lot of great music a lot of great food a lot of parties and it's wonderful (laughs) absolutely wow um, so we also have a lot of, um, you know, listeners and members who are newly minted BCBAs who are just getting into the field. Um, what is some advice that you might have for them or what is the best advice anyone's ever given you? I would say, you know, you're in for a great ride. <laughs> you're going to love this job. You're going to hate it sometimes. It's definitely not easy, not for the faint of heart, not for everyone, but it's definitely a job that it's, um, 
incredibly rewarding. It's definitely uh, 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 it's definitely a field that goes in line with very high um, moral uh, moral compass, you know, to or, or purposes, you know, your life purpose. The sort of thing that you uh, that you you know that you are here in this world to help others, uh, and this is a great way to do it. Um, I would just I would also say you know don't don't give up it, if this is difficult. Yes, it's difficult at times, but it's incredibly rewarding, and go for it. <laughs> it's not just a job; it kind of becomes your your mission. Takes oh, over. yes. For better or worse. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And it's great. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, okay. Well, this was super educational. And thank you for sharing with us your experience on, um, you know, cultural competency and serving the communities that you serve. And like we said, there's just so much that we can learn from every every person and every BCBA and the different ways that they practice and the different ways that they've, um, you know, really individualized this whole field because we're more than just the set of principles, right? We're people who are implementing all those principles. So it's nice to get to know all the people. Um, so thank you for, for joining us and we'll put the information about your agency and all that in the show notes. Um, and it was really nice to speak with you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking with you ladies. I feel like I know you, like I've known you forever. Oh, well, thank yeah. you. It's nice to do this. It's nice to get to know the people who we haven't yes. gotten to see yet. It's so nice yeah. to be, for us, it's so nice to be able to put not only a face behind the name, but also a personality behind the name. Um, so I love it. And it was really great <laughs> to get to know you. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for having me. Thanks for joining today's conversation. Wherever you get your podcast, please go and subscribe, rate and review so others can find out about us too. For more from How to ABA, including free resources and ABA materials, visit our blog at howtoaba.com and make sure that you're following us on social media for more practical tips and updates.